Drums to Podcast. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Catching Up with Web Performance, a podcast about stories of people and web performance. Today, my special guest is none other than Barry Pollard. Barry, how's it going, man? Good, good. How's yourself? I'm hanging in there. Life is wild. Trying to edit audio, do all the things, but we're hanging in there. No, I'm interested to see this series and hear from uh, other people. I know my own story, but there's quite a few people <laughs> I know have signed up for this. So looking forward to hearing them. Me too. Now, the gist of the show, I mean, it's pretty simple. Every episode, I ask people the same questions. Like, how did you get into web performance? How did you learn? What are things you find interesting or difficult? So I like to start with the memory. I think that's a good way to get grounded. So I'm going to ask you here, like, what's your first web performance memory? So I got into web performance kind of late. Uh, I got into the web very late, actually. In the first half of my career, I was uh, in, in banking, actually, um, doing traditional software development in there. And I went to university in Scotland, in Edinburgh, and I was approached by banks down in London, went down there, did an internship uh, for Goldman Sachs, and then went down and worked for some of the other big banks there, Citigroup, JP Morgan, and a few others. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I was doing traditional bash scripts, a bit of... Uh, C development, JavaScript, uh, Java development, but I kind of didn't really touch the web for a, uh, a long time. But what I did touch was performance. So I worked in the equity derivative space, and they have a lot of overnight batch job. They use thousands of compute um, servers that you know does all these various calculations to be ready for the next trading day. And part of my role was to optimize that as much as possible because they were spending millions of dollars on, on servers there, and we had to use that as best we could. Some of them were very complicated instruments that would take hours to calculate. Some of them were very simple. And just throwing everything at the servers and, and expecting it to figure it out led to very suboptimal um, loading where either we wouldn't ramp up and all the servers wouldn't get used before, or we'd, you know, that would happen if you put a lot of simple jobs in there. By the time you'd loaded them on there, they were finished, and then the next lot hadn't finished loading and so on, so you never got the full utilization. And if you did the reverse and threw all the complicated jobs, you ended up, you know, an hour before trading opening with most of your jobs not done and big panic of whether it would get done, uh, it would actually get through the job there. So you had to balance that and optimize that um, to best utilize the resources um, that you got. And some of that was like it was making database queries to get a lot of the information it needed to do these jobs. And it was also um, farming out the jobs to um, these huge server farms. So that was my first sort of introduction into performance rather than web performance. Mm -hmm. And yeah, from then on, it was kind of hooked. It was really interesting problem to try and figure out and tune and tweak and um, almost run real-time experiments on millions of dollars worth of hardware. Um, you know, we sit there, we talk and we say, like, let's change the prioritization to do this and, and see what happens overnight. And some of the riskier ones we do at the weekend where we had a bit more time to play with if it, in case it went horribly wrong. Um, but yeah, we were actually going in there, making changes, seeing what it was. Um, trying to save money because I mean these banks have a lot of money, but they don't have unlimited money, and we don't have unlimited hardware. And even if we did, we couldn't farm out the jobs and stuff like that. So that was the first half of my career, um, and that was all spent in London. And then I met my wife. We started having a family, so we moved back to to Ireland, and I had to look around for another job. And there wasn't a huge amount of investment banking jobs in the small part of Ireland that I'm currently living in in Cork. Yeah. Um, so I had a bit of a career change at that point. And uh, not too far, because I went and worked for a health insurance company, so still finance, but I um, went in there as project manager, eventually ran the, the software development team, and they had a website, and um, that became a bigger part of it. So I really started getting into the web there, um, and that was about 10 years ago. Mm. And as I said, I'd done basic HTML, what developer hadn't at some point, but I'd never really understood the web as a whole. So yeah, quite delayed, but once I got into that, Again, it was the similar sort of thing, this this idea of optimizing and tuning. And it wasn't just the, the performance side. I um, Initially, I started looking at the security side. We, we started beefing up our security there. I mean, as a health insurer provider, we had a, a big onus on ours to make sure we had a secure website. So, And it was a, a lot of the same things. You see web performance, it was running a website through these tools, which would tell you how your TLS certificates are set up and um, or have you got these HTTP security headers and what you can do with those and started learning about, you know, more complicated things like um, content security policy and those sorts of things. And that kind of naturally led to other bits where, and other tools, you know, running your, your uh, website through Lighthouse or some of these other tools, which could spot problems. And a lot of them were 
Lighthouse still is quite performance focused, um, but they had other bits in there that kind of hooks you in and then, and then gets you into there. Yeah. So that, that was my sort of earliest memory. It wasn't really into web performance, but then it kind of started in that space and started being on that journey down to here. That's so wild. Cause like, it sounds like you were in performance out the gate. Like it wasn't web performance, but it, here we are equity derivatives. Like we need to make sure these operations are moving quickly and fast and efficiently. Yeah. And I wasn't a natural plan to go into that. It was kind of just my, the job that I ended up with. I mean, I originally started in back office stuff and then moved to the front office and that was a key important part and we were having big problems with that. So. Yeah. Did you go to university like and learn computer science there or? Yeah, I did a software engineering degree, which, you know, doesn't give you, it gives you broad strokes and I think it is very useful, yeah. but um, it's very different to the practical of actually doing stuff. Like what? Like how? I think it teaches you general principles, um, but take SQL, for example. Um, I mean, I'm old, so web performance wasn't a course when I was at university. But there you do a basic course in SQL and um, SQL, and you know you get to know to write queries, and you do that for a, a term or a semester, whatever you got. But until you're doing it day in, day out for your job, you're not really learning it. You're not really seeing it. You're not seeing, understanding, certainly, the performance impacts that you get rough concept of indexes and how that, they might help and so on but yeah. it's only by using it day in day out that you actually see it so i wouldn't say people out of university myself included are ready to hit the ground running um, whenever they join a job and graduates do need a lot of um, help and training whenever they, they go into a job yeah um but what it does give you is a great grounding in a lot of you know concepts and, and, and a broad scope of the whole software development life cycle and, and process and what, what can do yeah and then I want to ask you more about education later, but yeah, making the switch from you finish university, go into equity derivatives, uh, software engineering, and then eventually you switch to web. Can you describe what were some of the differences or were there differences between like general software performance or what you were doing before and then web performance that you were doing after? I think there's a few things Like what I immediately liked about the web is you can put something on there and it's globally available to everyone. You don't have to package it up, compile it, create a package, put it in the, send it out in floppy disk or CDs or stick it in an app store. It's just there. It's it's available for everyone. So yeah. that and and it's it's so visual and easy to get uh, something up there. You know, a few lines of HTML code, and you've got a blog or um, or even um, some interactive widgets. You know, menus and and drop downs are, are very easy to add if you throw a framework at it and stuff like that. So I think the barrier to entry on the web is is so small. Mm. Um, now, there's a knowledge barrier, um, which I'm guessing I'm going to talk about here, which is much larger. But saying that, there's a lot of resources out there that, that can do that. But if you compare it to, I don't know, writing a Java program just to try and get, like, there's a reason that a lot of these things do Hello World, which is command line, very boring things. To get GUI and actual applications up and running is much more complicated. Uh, and some of these older, pro, uh, not, sorry, not older, some of these more traditional um, <laughs> non-web uh, programmers, I don't want to insult all the, the Java and C++ uh, developers out there. No offense. <laughs> But, but, you know, the web, the web is so instant. Literally, notepad plus plus a few lines of HTML, open it in your browser, and it's there. Stick it on a server, and it's there for everyone. Yeah. And that was, like, before all this, you know, CI, CD, and Jamstack and, and things, which make it even easier for doing that. Yeah. Are there things then that, like, because there's some of the differences or some of the things that excited you about the web. It's instant. It's publishing. The barrier to entry is so much lower. Are there things that you were able to, I don't know, the, what do you think may have equipped you or what things uh, did you take from your experience in software optimization and bring that to web optimization? Um, I think, again, I'm not very technical in a lot of things. Uh -huh. um, I get massively uh, invested and geeky about certain things and develop a uh, passion for it like I have for web performance and, and read up about those. But I think what, what I was good at was the broad strokes of seeing the whole thing or, or knowing a little bit about this. My JavaScript is still terrible, by the way. Um, <laughs> my CSS isn't that much better. Um, but, you know, having a broad understanding of how it all fits together. And I guess that's probably because I didn't start as a web developer and there you go and write some JavaScript code and you go up there. I kind of started as a more traditional developer, eat my way slowly into this. And so I had, uh, I guess, some of the background of other things and, and back end processes and how those sorts of things work. So I think what I found useful was having that bigger understanding of the whole thing of how everything fits together. And also not just going, it's magic. Oh. I remember a lot of my like non-IT users, they were like, 
okay, can you do a program to do this? And they just conceptually couldn't get the switch between what was easy to do and, and, and you know, relatively easy versus completely impossible. So I don't know, you'd just be doing a pivot table in, in Excel and they'd be like, wow, you're some kind of computer genius. Whoa, can you can you figure out which my customers are? I've got no money in the bank. And I was like, no, <laughs> what mind are those two things the same? But I don't know, again, maybe because of the, the educational background and having a, a software a development degree kind of gave me the broader picture there of doing that. But then that also allows you to see a lot of low-hanging fruit in a lot of these things. Mm. So you can sit there and say, okay, the web page is served fast, but then it's taking a long while to go. Then you know where you can concentrate on that. Or, yeah, it's taking a while to even present any of the, the data there. Is it your server that's slow? Is it SQL queries that are um, creating the data to, to do that if you're uh, you know, a traditional server-side rendered application or something like that? I think that's where it can be quite helpful to have that broad stroke and, and um, be able to delve into anything and, and and figure out exactly where it needs to go. And then farm it out to the experts. So I ran a software development team in my last job. Mm-hmm. As I say, my JavaScript wasn't great, but I would be able to identify a JavaScript problem and say, okay, and you hardcore JavaScript developers, now go and figure it out because this is the problem that, it's, that we're seeing is it's been slow to do that. Do you have an example of one of those? Like what was a time where that happened where you said, hey, I found a problem with this JavaScript or something about this we need to make better. And then you explained that and gave it to an expert. I guess like um, we used a lot of client-side rendered stuff, so uh, single page applications, which I think for an application is fine. And there's a small pause in, in loading it and then you get in the app and you're sitting there moving it around. So if you're in a big, long checkout workflow, um, you're going through steps and you're giving payment details and your address and then you're buying it, maybe that upfront hit is worth it. Uh, whereas for a more just homepage or an article page, less so uh, in my mind. Um, so we use these a lot because we had applications on on our website and stuff like that. And in general, they're a bit slow to load, but we knew that. Um, but I think what the biggest thing we found was with the whole Core Web Vitals initiative that came out a few years ago mm. was, yeah, we knew what, which pages were slow and fast to go. And in general, our website was fairly fast and they, it would render pretty quickly. Um, some of the apps weren't u- as used as much as uh, some of the static pages, so they kind of offset each other and it was it was fine. But where we really struggled was um, with cumulative layout shift or CLS. So we had these single page apps that were loading in piecemeal, content was shifting around, or quite often they were loading a skeleton page from about 10 versions ago that had changed completely. It would flash on screen and then the app would kick in and move things around and do what the, the ultimate page was. And people weren't concentrating that much on the, the actual loading. They were just sitting there going, yep, the app loads and it works and not seeing that. But the browser saw everything and was reporting these massive CLS shifts that uh, were causing us there. So that point, it was like, okay, I don't know SPAs. I don't know what you guys are doing in there, but here's the problem. Oh. Can we go ahead and, and, and fix that? Can we update our skeleton pages? Can we get it to, to load more um, progressively in, in, in sections? Can we set min heights even? You know, a lot of them were fairly simple um, things that you can, you can do just to, we know there's going to be a bit of a widget in here, reserve that space uh, and then go that. And some of that we could, you know, we could do short term. We could just add a few styles to our style sheet to actually fix that without re-engineering the whole app or do that short term and then longer term say, okay, now do we need to do a, a bigger re-engineer? Do we need to do more server-side rendering? Do we need to get rid of this SPA technology completely and stuff like that? But that's obviously going to take time. But there's a lot that we could do in the meantime to just at least minimize the problem and, and get a nice little green flag from Google to say that all is good. Yeah. And speaking of core web vitals then, so I've got a couple touch points in the story so far. University, graduated, software engineering, went into, what do you call it? Banking? Equity derivatives? Uh, yeah, investment banking. Yeah. Investment banking. Yeah. So graduate from university, software engineering, go into investment banking, and then get into insurance. Uh, is this Leia? Leia? Leia Healthcare? Yes. Yeah. If you look me up here. Yeah. I tried to do a little research before. Stalking, you know. <laughs> <laughs> But there's, you know, there's some, I want to hear more about this time because you, you switch over, you're in the web, you have to learn, and then there's core web vitals and you write a bunch of core web vitals articles for Smashing Magazine. Like what, how, how, what was in between there where you got introduced to the web or rather started working on the web and then core web vitals, like catch me up. What happens in that block of time? Yeah. So there's a big gap between that. Um, as I say, I started getting into the web, and that was only half my job. We still had a, the back-end systems that we all looked at and the in-house systems that we looked after as well, but I was quite attracted to the website of it. And our website was only one small part of my role, but 
one of the most interesting parts. So we spent a lot of time optimizing that and I'm obsessive by nature. So whenever I plug the website into any of these tools like Lighthouse and it gave me less than a hundred score, I'd be like, oh, okay, right. <laughs> uh, what can we do to fix this? So I'd read a lot there and find out more about the, what these things actually meant um, because there, there is some understanding you need to know and you can't be too obsessive. Um, to see that is um about these sorts of things you got to work out is this really the best use of your time you know going from 90 to 99 is that really a, a you know a game changer there uh and is it worth it or is it mostly fast and are those tools artificially slow just to highlight problems and those sorts of things mm. so i spent a lot of time looking at those understanding whether there was a real problem which meant becoming more knowledgeable in in the field um i read an awful lot i've got a book face full of web performance books up there what are some um, of the books you read um Oh, God. So Steve Souders, I started with, mm -hmm. back to the original man that kicked this whole thing off. Um, let's have a look. I'm trying not to read out my own book. Um, <laughs> with performance in action, a couple of from Jeremy Wagner that I work with now. Yeah. Um, using web page test from Rick that I work with now. That's all people I work with. Fantastic. Um, <laughs> yeah, quite like a few just there. And I've got more in my Kindle. Yeah, I'm just obsessively reading loads of information there. Also, people were blogging a lot. Oh. I really like this about the generally the web community, but um, web forum community in particular, people do blog a lot. And some of the more interesting sites aren't from, you know, the big names. Um, like which ones? Well, like indi like individuals, individual bloggers, which what I started doing. Um, I think that's more interesting. They seem more real um, yeah. and honest um, and do that. And also... A lot of the, back in the early days, a lot of the, the big websites, you know, the, the Googles, the Smashing Magazines and so on, weren't necessarily doing so much on web performance. It was a bit of a niche topic mm. um, back then. So you had to go to niche, niche people. Yeah. Do you recall anybody who was talking or like who were some of those early bloggers that you followed? Oh, God. Um, loads of people. Like um, Names are escaping me now. Um UAF Vice uh, did a lot of stuff. I watched a lot of talks about them. Um, Pat Means talks are brilliant. Uh, Jake Archibald obviously does a lot of stuff in that area and does really entertaining talks and stuff like that. Andy um, blogged a lot on that. Tim Breek, um Yeah, there's just loads of people in the, in the community. Tons that of are them. Doing that. And they find weird and, and obscure things that you know, aren't in the manual as such, but kind of make sense once you can, again, put, put the whole piece together, which I find really interesting. Do you have any that come to mind, like any of those interesting, weird things? So Matt Hobbs wrote a lot about web page tests and how to read the waterfalls, and he found all sorts of weird, obscure things with, I don't know whether they were EV certs or um, cores, his, his favorite subject. Oh my God. Matt's article, his web page test, like how to read a waterfall chart, is so comprehensive, it's unreal. Yeah, and he kept adding to that and all that. But again, there was the, there was the weird things of, hey, I noticed this. It was, why is this going and delving into that? And, and, and like the community is incredibly open for that sort of thing. There's people who engage a lot on Twitter. You know, you were able to speak to some of these people whose books are on my shelf on Twitter and, that, and they would respond back. And there's a Slack web force channel that's, that's really active that people are sitting there constantly helping and stuff like that. So yeah, I kind of got into that and, and got really interested in reading that. and then. Responding to that, I guess I probably started in Stack Overflow and I started answering a load of questions there. Um, asking very few questions, by the way. I think you can look up, <laughs> I've, I've asked about three questions in my Stack Overflow life and answered hundreds. I don't know. I, I, That's interesting. Just, Do you, so you learn more by answering than by asking? Yeah, and I find mostly the problems that you've got aren't unique. Mm. Um, and there's a wealth of information out there if you just know how to search for it. And uh, I don't know, I think searching is a skill that. Again, some people have and some people don't. Um, so if you dig hard enough, you can usually figure it out yourself. And I say, you're not unique. There will be someone who's experienced the same problem. Mm. Hopefully they've written up about it. And then that's the other thing is whenever you find something that's slightly different or took you a while to figure out, I love to blog about it. I love it when other people blog about it there and then other people can learn from it. So yeah, outside of my job, I started blogging at that point. Um, and again, the barrier to entry is cheap and relatively simple. So my blog hasn't been touched really since I put it up there. It looks awful. Um, I don't think people are coming there for design tips or anything like that, but it's functional. It's got a load of articles that got st people started reading. And again, sticking Google Analytics in there and seeing that people from China or um, Australia or whatever were benefiting from just uh, some random stuff that you put on there was really um, engaging. I'm pathetic and needy and <laughs> need this validation. <laughs> um, we, so we like that. And people email me and say, thanks very much. This is helpful. This is really useful, which I was just like, oh, cool. This is really good. Yeah. 
And then after that, yeah, like a publisher approached me and said, uh, you wrote a post on HTTP2. We're considering doing a book in the area, uh, in that space. Would you be interested? And if so, would you like to submit a proposal? So I did that, um, thinking this will take a couple of months and this will be good. <laughs> Fast forward two years of my life later, <laughs> um, I eventually got a book that sold very little. Oh, um, you, this book? No, but that, that, that was really interesting. That book? Oh, uh, I, there was I a, sold at least one copy. There was a shipping delay, so I wasn't able to get the physical copy yet, but I was very excited to have this. I've had the digital copy. Oh, but you could have got away with it. I didn't even know it was because you printed it out in color there. <laughs> but yeah, what? So two two years, my lord! You spent two. For, you started with blog posts. Somebody asks you to write a book, and you do it. Two years. That's wild. Yeah, I mean that was. I found that really interesting. Like for a start, HTTP two at the time was relatively new. I mean, it was out there, but people weren't using about it, and there wasn't a lot of material available to it. So I started looking at it, and I had to hobble together all the information from a lot of those people I mentioned previously. Uh, Pat done a load of good talks on it. Uh, Jake and you have also published good articles on it. But uh, yeah, you had to hobble it all together to try and figure it out. So whenever they said there, hey, do you, are you interested? I was like, yeah, this actually... This could make me a millionaire and I could have thousands <laughs> of uh, adoring fans all over the world. It turns out, no, not so much for a little niche topic like that. But um, no, I thought it would be good. I always liked writing. I don't have a problem wittering on about things, as I'm sure you've noticed on this podcast. And I found it quite relaxing. I had a, a, I had a young family at the time. I wasn't able to do any of the writing during the week. I had a day job and I had a, f a young family. Um, so that was a re also read in the evenings and stuff like that, but didn't really do that. And Saturdays I kind of took for the family, but my wife was very, uh, very good to me and understanding. And she took the kids off on Sunday and Sunday I would spend, you know, eight, 10 hours wow. in front of the computer, um, either researching stuff or writing or more often than not deleting and starting again. Um, but it was kind of calming. It's kind of nice um, to do that. And it was on my own time. As I mean, that's why it is. I'm sure you could bang out the book a lot quicker if you're doing it full time, but I was doing it one day a week um, over the two years. So don't feel too sorry for me. And I managed to get away from the screaming kids at that time. Um, but I really delved into that topic, really um, did that and spent a lot of time, learned a lot from myself. I think there's this, I don't know if there's an old adage or something, if you want to learn something, write the docs on it because mm. you're going to have to figure it out and, mm -hmm. and, and do that. And then I finished it, put the pen down, and was very happy, handed over to the publisher, and then the IETF announced HTTP3, and I was like, oh, thank God, for sake. <laughs> <laughs> Timing is useless. It just keeps moving. So I managed to tweak it slightly during the editing process to put a few sprinkles of HTTP3 in there, but uh, yeah, yeah. I did. Dang, this is wild, because I feel like you've you've covered, it sounds like the whole learning spectrum, right? Like from going to university, going to a job, switching jobs, learning on the job, then learning through Lighthouse, getting obsessive about the metrics and scores that it gave you, trying to learn more about those, going to Stack Overflow, listening to talks, finding people, um, reading books, you know, then getting deeper in not just reading books, but finding like those people, finding the blogs, and eventually writing your own book. Like, I don't know how much further you can push the learning spectrum there. Like, that's that's wild. <laughs> no, but I, I mean, that's the thing is there's always something to learn. It's, it's such a wide scope, the web and, and web performance even uh, as part of that is no one's ever going to be an expert in it. And it's changing so much anyway. And I think I'm fascinated in two ends. One is I say there's a lot of low hanging fruit. Nothing annoys me more than a website that's bad and by bad i mean slow often or just doesn't load or breaks half the time or you know you click a button and it's you get a javascript error pop up instead of it submitting and you're like oh my god so a lot of those can be fixed quite easily which is even more frustrating that they don't fix these things mm. um so that, that's one thing is like oh actually it's quite easy to fix a lot of these things um and yeah some of them are more complicated and you have to go down the rabbit hole and get weirdly obsessive like i do but a lot there is there's fixing which that, that's one good side on the other end of the spectrum there's a lot of really fascinating nitty-gritty problem-solving things to figure out where something should work but it's not working. And why is this? And there's this whole web, uh, for want of a better word, of interconnectedness of how things can, you know, ch subtly change something else or knock something else on or knock something out of bounds or something like that. So again, that's also fascinating to me. If there is no easy fix, you really have to delve in and figure that out. And might not even be anything you're doing wrong. It could be a browser bug or a feature just isn't working as it should, or it's still on the way of standardization and it's only partly there and 
that particular use case isn't there yet and will come in the future and there's not much you can do about it. Mm-hmm. So I think it, you can always find something of interest to go there. I don't think at any point we'll close the book on it and say, yep, yeah, web is done. <laughs> yeah. And you know, speaking of it being so large and just like, oh, but not only web performance, but the web. I'm, I'm curious, like, how do you think about web performance, maybe in general, or, or if I had to push you to give me like a definition, maybe like when you think of web performance, what stuff do you think of? I honestly come back to my initial definition of a good website, and you can put it down to metrics of whether it's, you know, the older low time metrics or the new fancier core web vitals, user experience measuring metrics, or just gut feel of this is a bad website. People do it whenever they see it, you know, you can go to quite often, you know, your internal apps, your expenses apps, or whatever, they're usually great candidates for bad websites because they've got your captive market and they don't have to do it. Um, Whereas, you know, the more you know, comp- competition you get, the, the usually the, not a terrible website might be able to be able to load faster, might be able to be not slightly nicer in certain things, but it's usually not a terrible experience. But what if you load something and you're staring at a white screen for ages? Or like I'm in just outside the city of Cork, but it's quite a small city and it's not for long to go out into the countryside. Um, or you're on a train and you know, nothing loads and you have to hit refresh a few times and you're still staring at the white screen or even worse, an SBA spitter. And those things annoy me and, and frustrate me. And I'm just like, oh my God, how can you have such a bad web? How can you not have personal pride in what you're producing? How, do you, <laughs> how are you happy with this? Um, and I know there's constraints and people aren't doing it, but um, certainly whenever I was in charge of a team that did that, I did my best to make sure that it was a good website. It loaded reasonably quickly and, um, and was, you know, pleasurable to use rather than a pain to use that, you you know, you're only using because you've got no choice. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, web performance, I think what's interesting is the shift from just load, uh, which is still important and still being measured by this LCP. But I think that the other parts of it, the... The shifting stuff around, I think CLS is my favorite core web vital. I love that. It's like it brought a new dimension to web performance that a lot of people, myself massively included, had kind of ignored. We knew it was a problem, but they were like, eh, it's not a big problem. And then kind of it was thrown on the front of the face of, well, now it is a problem. Now you have to fix it. And I was like, yeah, yeah, it is. And we should have fixed it a while ago. And, <laughs> and like websites are getting more pleasurable to use there. And like if you're loading, I keep using BuzzFeed as an example, but they're really annoying because they've actually fixed it. So they used to be the worst sort of thing. Whenever you went to those sorts of websites and ads would pop in, the article would spin down and you couldn't, you lost your place and, and that would be really irritating. Right. Um, I know they did an awful lot of work to try and, and fix that, which again, I think was driven by that initiative, which is really good. So it's not just about getting something on there. It's actually making it usable once it's on there. And and then even after that, you know, buttons should be responsive and click them and, and move them around. Scrolling shouldn't be all jittery and yankee and so on so yeah i think that again we're we're kind of we're at a point of evolution in web performance where we're moving from page load as a measure to full um page life cycle um which is quite interesting because it's kind of the next step of yeah we knew about that for a long time not everyone fixed it but mm-hmm. we knew it was a problem now there's all these other things that we kind of intuitively or maybe at the back of our heads knew it was a problem but never really surfaced before as that's web performance right yeah, I think CLS in particular, really, before CLS, I think we mostly talked about web performance as speed, time. It's all about time. It's all about speed, doing things fast. Whatever the thing is, whether it's loading or responding, like, do that thing fast. And then out comes CLS. Oh, by the way, there are things that are not about time. There are things more about the experience. Uh, layout shifts, like there are other things that can cause a frustrating experience. And, you know, then we get notions of smoothness or battery life, I don't know, energy efficiency. And I've seen a lot of other interesting talks about performance. And I think, yeah, CLS feels like it single-handedly blew open this notion of performance is not just speed. It's this whole, I don't know, package of experience. Yeah, I think that there's two things that the Core Web Vitals initiative brought in um, I mean, there was a whole SEO big stick, which gave it the, the emphasis it had. But ignoring that, the, the two things it brought was, yeah, some of these different metrics from page load. And then the other big change was looking at field. Yes. So it didn't matter what Lighthouse was. It didn't matter what that green 99 score was. It was your users are all on worse devices or worse networks than you are um, with your big fancy computer right next to the server room. 
and they're a lot slower than you are. Or again, come back to full page life cycle of your CLS is fine and loading, but as soon as you go to another page or scroll down, there's a lot more CLS there that was hidden that you didn't see from these traditional tools that measure just page load and they're just as disrupting and now boom it's in your face so i think whoever came up with that concept of measuring field rather than just basing it on lighthouse scores was genius man yeah field data actually that is such a good point i've been trying to reflect on the past two years for me and like how core web vitals has you know reshaped my understanding of performance and field data like single-handedly i literally did not know what a percentile was until Core Web Vitals. You do know, <laughs> right? <laughs> right, but you know, it um, it that's a this is a whole nother uh, side of things, and maybe this is a, a segue place we can go to, because Core Web Vitals came along, and all of a sudden I needed to know statistics, at least to some degree. Like I didn't know that web performance was typically like a log normal distribution. Like I had no idea what a long tail was. That concept never, I never heard of that, and then all of a sudden. Oh yeah, here actually there's a distribution of users. I didn't think of people in distributions. I didn't know that was a thing. Um, I'm curious, have, did you have a similar experience or like how what's been your experience with field data? Hey, I'll start with that. Well, as I say, I think again, the field data in my mind is is two things. One is not everyone experiences it the same. And do you have some people that are on worse phones, worse networks, or whatever? And that's definitely one big aspect of it. Um, I think we kind of knew that. And you know, some people had run solutions that told them that before, but in general, most people, the vast majority, didn't really care about that, and they just stuck it in Lighthouse and got their green ninety nine and were happy. Um, so that that's that's one thing. Um, and I think there is awful because of that a lot of noise in there. And I think this whole percentile thing that you alluded to there, the fact that Core Web Vitals ignores only looks at the seventy fifth percentile, so ignores the really extreme cases. I don't think you really need to know that much more unless you really want to get in, in, into it too deeply. I mean, I think that's a concept of they do try to simplify it. They do sit there and say, look, there are these three metrics rather than the thousands of weird DOM content loaded and whatever the heck that means and this, that and the other. There's three things that are relatively easy to explain conceptually, at least. Hmm. LCP, what's your biggest content? When's it getting on the page? How long does it take to get on the page? Okay, and you can go into the detail of when's it measured, what does it include redirects, does it this, does it that, and, and so on. What counts as an LCP element, what doesn't, and stuff like that. Forget it. As a high level, the biggest content, how long does it take to be on page? You can, I can explain that to my father, and he'll get that. Similarly, CLS, how irritating is it things moving around, and when you click on the wrong button, or you're reading an article and you lose your place, and stuff like that. Massively complicated to think about how you measure that, but as a high level, quite easy to explain. And you can sit there and say, you're passing or feeling or needs improvement uh, on that. It's, it's again, traffic light system, quite easy to understand. And FID, nobody talks about FID, so we'll kind of ignore that in a minute. But yeah, I think explaining that as a sort of thing and that necessitated, because field data is so noisy, and necessitated taking rid of that. But the other side of, of field data that I think is as important, if not more important, is the whole measure of the page life cycle so as i say rather than just the page load and what appears above the fold um as you scroll down as you interact as you do other things um what else is happening on your page there and how does that affect you i think again you can't really measure that except with field data so yeah being able to see that and, and understand that oh i thought it was perfect because i loaded it in lighthouse and i didn't scroll down versus oh right okay there is this weird thing further down or or for this subset of users that are logged in and get a slightly different um, experience, or this other user who, um, I don't know, is no longer a member and gets a different banner image saying, oh. we're sorry to see you leave, compared to the vast majority of users who are getting that. That's and the second aspect of field data that really got exposed. Yeah, which, speaking of different users, I recall you wrote an article for Smashing Magazine. You actually did a case study on Smashing Magazine's performance. Were there any interesting takeaways from that, or can you tell me more about that experience? That sounds like a leading question, like you know the answer, but yes. <laughs> um, you bet it is. So yeah, I, I started back to my story. I started blogging a lot. I wrote this book, and then I started um, writing a lot for Smashing Magazine. Um, actually, Jeremy, who I work with, reached out to me, so he's, he's him to thank for my 
long posts in there because he was the first person to reach out to me. Thank you, Jeremy. Yeah, so I, I they, because I'd written a couple of articles, Matilda reached out to me and said, hey, we're having problems. We're not meeting this. We thought we had a FES website. Mm -hmm. What's going on? Why are we um, failing to meet this? Uh, okay, I didn't work for Smashing. I'd written a couple of articles for them and, and that was it. But this was quite an interesting thing. And again, I just got my... I got nerd sniped, so I spent a long time looking at it, um, trying to figure out what was going on here, because at the same time I was trying to figure out for my day job, but I was also figuring out for my after hours geekery and blogging, um, and I was like, the Smashing Magazine is a fast website, they, you know, they they have spent an awful lot of time optimizing it, uh, Vitaly runs a course on, on um, web performance, and he used to produce a big huge checklist of all the web performance changes that happened that year, so... Uh, the fact that he couldn't get it right um, was interesting to me. And again, plugging it through the lighthouse and stuff, it did show it as fast, but it was showing as a problem in their core web vitals and in their crux data. So I spent a lot of time trying to figure out what that was and um, certain pages, and it looked to be a lot of older pages rather than newer pages, and we couldn't figure it out for a long time. And then we started collecting their own um, RUM data because like, Google makes a lot of it free through crux. I think actually slight adjacency there. That's the third good thing about this field data is mm -hmm. they basically given a reduced field data solution to everyone. Um, I don't think it's a full run solution, but and it's all very high level and it can be frustrating that you can't dig into that and, and so on. But they've basically said, plug in any URL into PageSpeed Insights or um, and you can see what any website, their field data looks like. Are they a fast website or, or not based on their users? Which again, I think just democratized field data before RUM solutions were very niche and um, and often quite expensive and people wouldn't uh, think about doing them unless you had, you know, you get the budget signed off by your IT director to install this and spent a lot of time doing it, whereas suddenly, boom, you just had it there. Um, now, I don't think it's sufficient. And I think you do need to, uh, if you are wanting to invest in web performance, um, then you should invest in a, a RUM solution top because I often said, actually just wrote an article on this, but the differences between Crux and, and the other one is... Crux will often tell you you've got a problem, but it won't tell you enough detail to say where or why or how, mm -hmm. um, whereas a, a full RUM solution, and it's, look, it's public by nature. There's a, there's you know there's some stuff that they can't make available to everyone about other people's sites. That's not very fair. Um, whereas a RUM solution that only you can see and you can control doesn't have any of those limitations and, and can't see that. So yeah, so we installed, and, and there's even free ones. Google published one, um, Web Vitals JS, that you can plug in the website and it can feed stuff back to something like Google Analytics, and you can go in there and slice and dice it as you see it. And at that point, we saw after we'd done that that a lot of the, the slow tell me traffic was coming from traditionally slower countries. So uh, India. India was a huge part of Chrome's, uh, sorry, of Smashing Magazine's visitors. Well, interestingly, it wasn't a huge part of their total visitors to the website whenever we looked in Google Analytics. But whenever you remember that Crux is only measuring Chrome, oh, and nice. if you filtered it only on Chrome, suddenly you're getting rid of all those iOS users in, yeah. uh, in the richer Western part of the world. And suddenly that had a much bigger percentage population of that. And suddenly it made much more sense of what they were slower. In the grand scheme of things, if you look at the total population, you can argue Crux isn't fair because of this. Um, but look, it's a limited view. And it, it was highlighting the problem there that they were having much slower experiences. And that suddenly then made sense and went, okay, right. Smashing Magazine is fast um, for Western uh, uh, people and faster internet connections and decent devices. And it's not slow in those uh, compared to everything else. It's just they're naturally slower networks, slower devices, older devices that often you know didn't have as much memory or CPU and stuff like that. At that point, we looked at some of the options there. Um, we... Slipped on. We actually did a, um, a setting where we didn't load web fonts um, if they had saved data set on, because a lot of them did have saved data to set on, um, and that brought it back enough, which is good because saved data seems to be in a bit of a uh, it's kind of moved into a different setting and its usage has massively dropped, which is disappointing. Mm. But yeah, that was that was really interesting to spend ages drilling down to that, and and you know that was the ten minute or ten second quick problem to solution, but it took months of figuring it out and trying other things and trying this and then going, oh, no, no, it's not that and stuff like that. Again, I wasn't working full time. I was just answering a couple of pings from uh, over Twitter saying, hey, what do you think about this? Should we try that? Or what do you think about that? Um, but whenever we nailed it, it's very satisfying to know why it was and, and understand why it was. And then not just go, eh, well, they're just going to get a slower uh, website. What can you do about it? To actually sit there and take it to the next level and go, okay, what can we do about it? Do they need web fonts? Is it a better experience for them not to have 
these web fonts that don't make that much difference and actually have it faster. And also, you're then at that point fixing the Barry Pollards who are on this train down in the outskirts of Cork, who's got very limited reception. People won't get the web fonts either. It wasn't something specific for yeah. India users. It was for slow users that this happened. And therefore, my experience got better in, in those extreme conditions and so on. So whenever we, um, I published that, there was a load of people saying, oh, my goodness, I knew there was unfairness and how dare they? And <laughs> should we block off uh, certain countries if they're not, no. um, <laughs> not adding to your bottom line and stuff like that? And I'm like, you're taking the wrong thing out of it. I thought it was an interesting thing. And I also gave the solution, which, by the way, is much easier than dual blocking stuff off. Mm -hmm. And if these people are a large proportion of your traffic, you've got to ask yourself, why uh, are you wasting money in SEU efforts pulling these people in if that's not the people that you want? Or is it like Smashing Magazine is different. It is a global magazine. But if you're a, a retailer that doesn't really sell to India, maybe you're like, well, why should I do anything for these people? Because they're not even selling. I can understand that different story. But then I would argue, why are you getting so much traffic from there? Are you wasting your ad bucks pulling that traffic in instead of pulling in, in real traffic? You need to look at that yeah. and actually see that. And I feel like we could do a whole nother, uh, <laughs> a whole nother couple hours talking about like, how do you know? How do you choose? What are these trade-offs? Like, man, tons of great stuff. Unfortunately, we are coming close to time. So we're gonna have to wrap up here. I'd love to know maybe in closing here, just like, what are you doing now? And what are, what are, where are your interests leading you now? So I'm incredibly lucky in that I moved on to my last job that I spent a lot of time talking about. And I I work for Google now, working on Core World Vitals. So nice. I'm getting paid to do my uh, what I was doing in my spare time to do that full time. That's fantastic. And yeah, no, it's a bit of a dream job for me. So I'm really happy. Been here a few months now and I'm working in the DevRel team. So my job is literally to speak to developers, do this outreach, do a lot of the stuff that I was doing, blog as what I can, go to conferences. Um, but as I say, get paid to do this full time as opposed to a very small part of my last job, which I probably overextended and definitely did into my uh, spare time. So my wife's happy that uh, I might get some of the evenings back uh, to spend with her rather than <laughs> geeking, because um, hopefully I'll get enough of it during the day job. But no, and, and I say I get to work with a lot of these people that I've admired and, and read up uh, for a long time. So it's it's fascinating to chat with these people every day and, and see how they're um, approaching things. And being on the inside, you know, there's a lot of, uh, oh, big evil Google doing this or a big corporation telling us what to do and stuff like that. But working here and again i've only been here a short time it's just people generally trying to do the right thing and trying to uh their best to do it and, and they haven't got it all figured out yet either but they're they're doing their best to, to fix that and there's always bugs in software and there's always things that we can do better but it's it's a never-ending journey that we're just gonna keep on trying to walk down so that's what i'm doing now um and i say it's a, been a few months so um, i'm sure the I'm going to find out next week that all the bad bits of the job that uh, are horrible compared to what I've uh, enjoyed doing up to now. Um, but so far, it seems to be going great. Well, that's fantastic. I'm excited to hear more from you. Excited to follow along the blog post, see the outreach of Barry Pollard. Thanks so much for coming on the show, Barry. Really appreciate your time. No problem. Thanks very much for having me.